So today, <clears throat> we're going to be, th this is going to be a first for the, uh, the channel. We are going to be reviewing a debate on the Modern Day Debate channel. And we're going to be reviewing specifically the debate between JF versus Lance of the Serfs over socialism versus capitalism. Because, you know... This I, I watched this debate when it happened, and I watched it over a lot of times, and everybody's been talking about it. Everybody in JF's community's been talking about it. Uh, everybody on BreadTube's been talking about it. Even, the, even though um, I normally make... I started making more scripted videos, I kind of want to do this because I feel like it. All right. And I'm going to, like, fast-forward through things because I don't want to make this recording too long. All right, let's get started. This is socialism, and we are starting right now with JF's opening statement. Thanks for being... Okay, that's a little too fast. And with us, JF, the floor is all yours. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've talked to a lot of uh, communists and socialists before, and so today I'm standing again for capitalism, and mostly I will be asking to the serfs, uh, does he have a plan for uh, certain problems that I perceive in socialism? For those of you who know me, those will be repeat problems, but I'd like to hear our uh, debate opponent tonight respond to these questions. The first thing is, are we acknowledging that humanity is a biological system? Are we acknowledging that the theory of evolution is true? Are we acknowledging that people are making more babies or less babies according to the characteristics that they have? This to me is a truth of life, but I don't know if my opponent that that laugh there denies it. To me, this is a simple fact of species on the earth. They evolve, they change, and they favor certain forms and they obtain certain directions uh, through evolutionary pressures. They become something. Now, once you realize this, you realize that any system ultimately will be an evolutionary system. Any political management by the way, if you've if you've been a fan of JF for a long time as I have, um, one of the things that you know is that because JF is trained as a bi is trained as a biologist, he tends to look at absolutely everything, or rather, a lot of things through the perspective of biology, including things that most people would not look at through the perspective of biology. Um, your education and specifically what you're trained in professionally affects how you look at the world to a great degree. And this is the same with JF. Because JF is trained as a biologist, he's going to look at economics through the perspective of biology. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we, we just got to note that. Oh, by the way, full disclosure... I am going to be coming at this through the in through I am going to be watching this debate from the perspective of a, of a JF fan because that's the perspective that I'm coming at this from. I am a big fan of JF as a YouTuber and I've been a fan of JF as a YouTuber for the longest time. So, full disclosure, I'm not unbiased. I am going to be biased in favor of JF. So, I'm, I'm just going to disclose my biases right now. It's plan for a society will be ultimately evolutionary, and although it's a more sensitive word, ultimately what it means is that everyone is participating to a form of eugenics, whether it's unintentional or intentional. Eugenics is happening, and so... <laughs> the, the look on, Sir, on Lance's face. To someone who tells me, I'm not a eugenicist, I will show you a bad eugenicist. Ultimately, you are influencing that <laughs> society. The, the, this, the absolute look on this guy's face. Comes and how people evolve. You just don't want to act. Is this thing still working? Okay. Acknowledge it or you don't want to recognize it, but ultimately you do. Now, the problem, once you realize that this is the state of humanity, that we will always be an evolutionary species, at least as long as we're engaged in baby making, is the fact that evolutionary... By the way, JF throughout this debate is going to say baby making rather than having children. So, <laughs> make it that what you will. ...systems converge 
especially when you start giving to certain features, especially when you start rewarding certain features, and especially when you start when you start adopting a needs-based approach. If if we were to go in the park and look at the squirrels and start feeding all of the squirrels according to their needs rather than their ability to gather nuts, we would find them ourselves in a million years from now, or maybe in a hundred years from now, with a bunch of fat squirrels incapable of caring for themselves, incapable of uh, of gathering in nature the foods that they need. And there's a very simple approach to this. It's the, the sometimes you'll see little signs that will say, "Don't feed the birds" or "Don't feed the squirrels." By not feeding the squirrels, we're trying to leave the evolutionary pressures go onto the birds or squirrel population so that they don't become incapa incapacitated by too much caring, by too much giving. And one of the fundamental issues with socialism, it's not the only one, but it's so grave that it's not fixable in my view, is the fact that its eugenic function is poor. It is poor because of the needs-oriented approach of socialism. Capitalism has its own way to exclude those who are unable to produce. If you don't make money in some way, if you don't produce something that some other people are willing to pay for, you would have less money and you would have less resources. And although it's not the case in our current society, because our current societies are not fully capitalistic, but in principle, in a fully capitalistic society, you would be essentially dying off from not having resources at all and having little babies. The problem is if you don't have that kind of eugenic function, if your policy is Let's give to everyone according to how much they need, which socialism does in one way or another, whether it's through some kind of universal check, some kinds of um, food distribution to the people or service distribution to the people. You are creating an infinitely reproductive needs function. That is, people are draining your calories. They're making babies with it. They, they haven't proven that they were cap capable of gathering those calories. You have just given them through the hand of the government. And eventually, you find yourself in the next generation with more poor people, more unable people, who are more dependent on the government. And who knows how much time it takes before this system reaches the end. History actually seems to demonstrate to us that it only takes less than 100 years before these systems crash. But it could take more than 100 years, and perhaps a communistic or socialistic society can be stable for 200, 300, 500 years. But what we know is that at some point, you're going to reach the problem that you are allowing the multiplication of needs while not incentivizing the addressing of needs. You're not, incenti you're not incentivizing it the way capitalism does. How does it do it? Capitalism incentivizes it by saying, if you find a way to address the needs of people, you're going to get money and you're going to be able to use that property in whatever way you want, including the ability to make babies. Communism and socialism do not do this. They incentivize inability, they incentivize people begging to the state without delivering to society, and therefore socialism is bound to fail in some term, whether it's short or long. You got it. Thank you very much, Jay. Okay. This is actually a really solid argument in favor of capitalism. The problem with this argument is that the logic within this argument if taken to its logical conclusion, is going to lead down to a really, really dark path, as we will see over the course of this debate. This debate is going to get really dark as it progresses because of JF's um, moral framework, that the moral framework that he's using for this argument. Even though the argument is good, it's good from like a logical and rational perspective, but it's a really dark argument, as we will see in... When, when this debate progresses. Yeah, for that opening statement, and we'll kick it over to Lance, but first, want to say, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics, and we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you were from. So thanks for being with us, and Lance, the floor is all yours. Uh, I just want to quickly say I will address all the points you brought up, but I just have a prepared statement, so I was going to use that for my first five minutes, if that's all right. Yeah. As you wish. <clears throat> all right. So when the last drop of monarchist blood had been spilt at the end of the French Revolution in 1799, the estates were converted into a national assembly, bringing an abolition to feudalism, state control of the Catholic Church, and for the first time, the ability to vote in a democracy. Promises were made of egalité, fraternité, and most importantly, liberté. Thus began not only the age of classical liberalism, but the age of capitalism. Capitalism has been the prevalent economics. Okay, this is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to make a minor point and a major point. Um, when most people think of capitalism, they principally think of, like, private property. They, they think of markets. And so... If we're going by most people's understanding of capitalism, arguably speaking, and again, this is like a minor point, arguably speaking, capitalism didn't begin with classical liberalism. Capitalism has been around basically forever since the first, uh, since the first um, man, like laid down laid down his uh, farming tools and said, "This area of farmland is my land." and I want to do whatever I want with it. 
Now, this is like a minor point. There is like historical dispute over over the exact origins of capitalism, but the the argument that I would make is that if capitalism is understood as just private property and ownership of the means of production, then I would argue that capitalism long predates classical liberalism. But there's a much more important make it much more important point that I want to make here. Lance had an opening statement where he he gives like the basic arguments against capitalism in favor of like bread tube socialism, which is what Lance is arguing for. The problem, though, is that JF, because he's looking at economics from the perspective of a biologist because of his education, came up with an argument in favor of capitalism that very few people would think of and that Lance is not going to end up addressing in his opening statement. ...system for the past 400 years, despite the promises of equality and liberty, Marx and Engels were able to observe how capitalism at its very core requires the exploitation of labor in order to be profitable. This isn't a matter of debate. In order to make money selling widgets, you first have to sell the widgets for more than you pay the workers who build them. This is what creates different classes in society between those who hire workers and the workers themselves. We've had several dynamics like this in human history, master and slave, lord and serf, and now we have employer and employee. Not that the advent of capitalism got rid of the other dynamics. In fact, they formed hybrids. Capitalism didn't appear in its final form from the very beginning. There was other versions like mercantile capitalism, which is essentially a form of usury. Various forms would appear and die off like economic systems before them. Modern forms of capitalism include both the Industrial Revolution and the riches brought to it by the white race through the North Atlantic slave trade. I use the term white race because it was colonizers who invented the concept of race in order to justify the subjugation of African slaves that they brought over to the Americas. Again, this is like the typical like crap you hear from the bread tube left work both in cotton picking in the south and textiles in the north. Hundreds of years of slavery combined with capitalism and massive vast amounts of wealth for a certain subset of Americans. It then evolved again with the invention of corporations which could insulate Is this thing still working? Yes, it is. The owner from the legal liabilities of his company. Corporate institutions have grown to be the dominant economy, uh, economies of the planet, many surpassing the GDP of entire countries. As these corporations grow into capitalism, they also consume competing companies in the form of mergers and acquisitions, creating complete monopolies in certain fields. And while it may be tempting to insinuate that J.F. Kreppi is unable to read his copy of Mein Kampf because the pages are currently stuck together with his own cum, or that hatred... Oh, the ad hominems. Okay. This, like, oh my god. The, the fucking, like, allegations that JF is a Nazi in the opening statement. Oh, Lord, that this... Oh, God. Um... Th that, that was an ad hominem. That's, that's like, n not good. This, when, when you're engaging in debates like this, it's kind of rhetorically better not to insult the person. Ugh, God. Of socialism and communism is because one of the most famous philosophers of those was Jewish. It should be pointed out that it's no surprise that a proud ethno nationalist would endorse an economic system whose final form is fascism. After all, the dictatorial regimes of Franco, Mussolini, and Hitler all followed a set pattern an authoritarian salvation of the capitalist system resulting in their oversight over its industries, a longing return to the mythical glory of their empires, a vilification of an entire people as a scapegoat, Catalonians or Jews, a distrust for the lying press, and finally the expansion of late or promised land in the form of settler colonialism. Corporations have no loyalty to the country of origin, their loyalties are. Okay, this, again, this is going to be like a minor point, but I should make it. Um. The fascists and Nazis were not capitalists in the way that Lance was talking about. The fascists and Nazis were followers of ideologies that, broadly speaking, fall under the category of third position, which is both anti-capitalist and anti-communist. So it's not completely accurate to say that the Nazis and fascists were capitalists. Now, if you use the definition of capitalism that I used before, which is just private ownership of the means of production, then, yeah, the Nazis and the fascists were capitalists. But capitalism as understood by, like, Lance of, like, modern capitalism, specifically modern, like, crony capitalism, no, the, the Nazis and the fascists were not capitalists in that sense. That's why those ideologies are generally referred to as "Quote unquote third position." Exclusive to producing profit for the shareholders. This can be seen in a company like IBM that is actually complicit in the Holocaust, developing the cataloging system necessary for the mass organization of the Jewish genocide. If one is to advocate for modern-day capitalism, they are also advocating for corporate dictatorships whose decision-making rests within a small handful of board members and CEOs. As I stated previously, these companies will devour one another until they have complete monopolist control in their field. It's, this further, it's for this reason today that in America, nine banks control the majority of wealth and assets we depend on. Eight food companies control all the products you see in the grocery store. Five media companies control all the movies, television, and radio podcasts we listen to. Three technology companies control the vast majority of social media in the world. Two companies produce the vast majority of beer in America. Under our capitalist system, six men own the collective wealth of seven billion people. The myth of a purely meritocratic system 
of which people advance solely on their talent wouldn't justify this disgusting inequality even if it was true, which it isn't. Capitalism is not resulting in the ecological disaster that threatens all life on Earth, yet the ability to stop CO2 output while pushing for an endless growth in a system with finite resources will eventually meet its catastrophic end. I'm sure it's inevitable that we will discuss the trillions of lives lost at the hands of the communists in China or Russia, but what I will be proposing here today is to look to other economic systems both from the past and present and analyze and adopt what is most beneficial to the vast majority of humanity. Any mature conversation about these topics should avoid playing team sports to previous ideologies and ascertaining which aspects are the most beneficial to everyone. In this, I state that no economy is completely given workers over the control of their own production, and that a starting point for us to achieve that in our current system is through the implementation of worker cooperatives and worker unions. The Italian region of Emilia Romagna is where one third of the GDP is successfully produced for worker co-ops, and the fifth largest umbrella corporation in Spain, known as Montecon, are two examples of such systems working efficiently. Now, I may just be a low IQ individual, but that doesn't take a lot of brain horse scopes to know the simple fact that our understanding of the universe evolves over time. Alchemy gave way to chemistry, as astrology gave way to astronomy. So too can our economic system evolve to one that is more democratic, more efficient, less exploitative, and better for every member of the human race. You got it. Thank you very much, Lance, for that opening statement as well. We are going to jump into the open conversation, folks. I want to remind you, we have many juicy debates coming up. As you can see, for example, at the bottom right of your screen, we are thrilled as on June 9th, Apostate Prophet and Dr. Michael Brown will be debating whether or not there's a God. You don't want to miss it, so hit that subscribe button so you don't miss it. It's going to be epic. And with that, we're going to kick it into open dialogue mode. Gentlemen, thanks so much, and the floor is all yours. All right, so perhaps I can just return to my initial questions to the serfs uh, or Lance or the serfs. Is that how are you? Are you either, either works. Yeah, no, Lance is okay. good. Serfs is good. Doesn't matter. All right, so my initial question was, so do we agree that humanity is a biological species with evolutionary forces, with natural selection applying to it? Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay, so do you understand the parallel between, say, a population of squirrels that I would feed constantly, no matter how good they are at gathering nuts, and do you understand that ultimately I would drive this population to become unable to, to do the gathering that they should do to survive on their own? Uh, so this is the first time I've heard squirrel theory. I've, I've heard Jordan Peterson propose this with lobsters before. Uh okay. The Jordan Peterson lobsters argument and JF's argument have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Uh, JF's argument is that if you feed if you feed the squirrels, you make them you select genetically for squirrels that are dependent upon humans to feed them, and it's the same thing with the government um, giving welfare to people. When you give welfare to people, according to JF, you're going to genetically select for people that are dependent on welfare. And JF considers that to be a bad thing. The Jordan Peterson lobster argument has nothing to do with that. The Jordan Peterson lobster argument is simply that hierarchy is natural among humans and the animal kingdom, and it's a natural state rather than a social construct because lobsters have hierarchies and specifically dominance hierarchies. The Jordan Peterson lobster argument has nothing to do with the argument JF is making. They're completely different things. Now, I'm no fan of Jordan Peterson. I have my problems with him, but but no. No, the Jordan Peterson lobster argument is a different thing. I would like to start to say that eugenics is a bad thing, and I don't think we should participate in it, uh, and I haven't heard anyone use it as a way of defending capitalism yet, but uh, I will say this in relation to squirrels. Almost all animals are... Okay, here's the, here's the problem with that, with the uh, eugenics is bad, with just simply saying, oh, eugenics is bad. Um, okay. Eugenics is a much more broad thing than most people realize. Eugenics, understood properly, is just the idea of improving your genes or the genes of a population through some sort of mechanism or specifically some sort of artificial or some sort of like artificial mechanism. The problem with Lance saying eugenics is bad is that Lance and JF are going to be talking past each other with regards to eugenics. JF is using the term eugenics in the correct way to mean just improving people's genes in general. The problem, though, is that there's a big difference between what eugenics actually is and what people think of when they hear the term eugenics. And when leftists hear the term eugenics... They get scared because they think of what happened in Nazi Germany with things like forced sterilization. And so Lance is hearing the term eugenics, and in his mind he's thinking, oh, Nazis forcibly sterilizing people. And so he automatically jumps to, oh, eugenics is bad. The problem is that um, you, you can't just say, oh, eugenics is bad. You have to like get into the actual policy positions that the eugenicist that you're debating is proposing. 
because JF, even though he's arguing for eugenics, he's not arguing for what most people think of when they think of eugenics. He's not arguing for, like, Nazi-style eugenics. He's arguing for eugenics as a result of the natural processes of the free market. On the uh, planet, with the exception of humans, are engaged in something known as homeostasis, in which they will basically have an equilibrium with the world around them, and that includes squirrels. Uh, for example, if you put a whole bunch of rats in a cage and you give them a finite amount of food, they will stop reproducing as the food supply goes down. That's something that most people engage in. Humans are unique to this planet in the sense that we continue to excavate and exploit and uh, expand upon the planet, despite uh, the, it could result in the detriment of all our lives. Exactly. So don't you see the problem in giving in that most consuming species? And I, I agree with you that we are a species at very high disequilibrium with nature. But don't you think, therefore, it is the worst species that you could possibly feed for free? Where does the free part come into this? Because you, you, well, like, have, we moved, have we moved past the squirrels? Are we on to squirrels to humans now? Yeah, we're talking about humans, and okay. I'm guessing that some aspect of your socialistic project must be to, to address the needs of the people. Maybe you should define what is socialism in your view. Sure, absolutely. So socialism is the worker control over the means of production and distribution. And in my proposal that I've laid out here, it's not going to handle the second part, but it's going to meet the first part. And in that, I want to expand democracy. The same way that you have democracy in your ability to vote for your elected leaders, I want the same democracy to be expanded into the place where you spend eight hours of your day every single day working in your job. So I think people in their jobs should have democratic control and say in their own positions. And so do you think that these uh, democratically controlled uh, production lines will be more efficient? Uh, they are more efficient, yeah. Most studies have looked at the efficiency rates of worker cooperatives compared to... Okay. The main issue with worker co-ops is not the inefficiency. The main issue with worker co-ops is that if we live in a world where worker co-ops are the only legal way to start a business, which is what most market socialists like Lance or Bosch propose, then it's going to be very difficult to start a business. Because every time you're a business owner in a worker co-op and you want to hire an employee, Functionally speaking, you're not really hiring an employee, you're hiring a business partner who's going to be owning part of the business in a world where worker co-ops are the only legal way of doing business, which is going to increase the risk of hiring people for companies, which is going to cause all sorts of different economic problems. So... The main issue with worker co-ops is not the worker co-ops themselves. The main issue with worker co-ops is the idea that worker co-ops should be the only legal way of doing business, or the, is the idea that the economy should be designed to where worker co-ops are the only legal way of doing business, which is what market socialists, or at least most market socialists that I watch on YouTube, propose to traditional capitalist enterprises have shown that they are typically um, more efficient and uh, less wasteful than their counterparts. And I guess that you're going to tell me what most communists come here to tell me, that they're more efficient, but they're not successful because there's a conspiracy against you guys in the banking system. Uh, no, I wasn't going to throw that in there. But if we're doing the brackets, I mean, I'd, I'd probably pivot back to the fact that they're, they have the same rate statistically of decay as their capitalist counterparts. They don't have the same rate of birth. So that means they do not start up as often as capitalist companies do. However, they fail at the same rate as capitalist companies. So if they were given the right or given the ability to start up on a regular basis, they would be just as efficient, uh, sorry, more efficient than the capitalist counterparts, but they would die or decay at the same rate. Now, what proportion of the population do you think it's important to them to be in control of their working place? And what proportion just doesn't care about it? Well, I don't think most people are aware of the ideas I'm proposing, which is why I'm trying to tell them on bigger platforms. So I don't think if I polled the average American, they would tell you that what they're looking for in their job is uh, ownership over their own production. They would probably tell you they're looking for financial security for their friends and their family, uh, and that's important to everybody. But in terms of what percentage should be, I'm advocating for all, every, every single job to be worker-controlled. Every Against the will of the people? Let's say, let's say there's a part of the economy that tells you, we want to stay capitalistic, our workers are perfectly fine with this. You would object to this continuing it to exist? I'm not forcing it upon anyone, though. I'm not saying that this has to come down from the government on high or that there has to be some kind of Stalinistic regime that forces people to do things against their will. I'm saying that this is what I'm advocating for. Whether or not people choose to do this is something that I hope that I can spread by... Okay. Lance is either... Okay, right here. Lance is either too stupid to understand the position that he's advocating for or he's actively lying about his position. And I'll tell you why. If Lance was simply advocating for worker co-ops to be legal and for worker co-ops to be a way of doing business, then by under his standard, we would be a social, America would be a socialist country because worker co-ops are perfectly legal in the United States. If you want to, you can start a worker co-op. 
but most but Lance does not consider America to be a socialist country which means that which means that his position or what he's saying now that he wants worker co-ops to happen but he doesn't want to force worker co-ops onto companies he doesn't want to force companies onto worker onto becoming worker co-ops if that's the position that he's advocating for then he would not need to advocate for anything because we already have the ability to form worker co-ops in the United States which means that the only reason why Lance would be advocating for worker co-ops in in this debate and specifically because he said before that he would like 100% of businesses to be run by worker co-ops the only logical way that he could do that is if he really does believe that the government should force worker co-ops onto people so Lance is either lying about his position or he's or he's too stupid to understand the view that he's advocating for but mo market socialism which is what Lance is advocating for is not just about forming worker co-ops market socialists want worker co-ops to be the only legal form of business meaning they don't just want worker co-ops to be created from like by like private business owners they want the government to come into say Burger King or McDonald's and force Burger King and McDonald's to be worker co-ops so so no Lance is either being stupid or he's actively lying about his position by telling this message to more people. All right, well, uh, I don't severely object against worker co-ops. I'm kind of enthusiastic about the fact that there are certain banks in Quebec that were worker co-ops. They turned out to be not so not so well managed and offering fees that became uninteresting with time. But I mean, in a capitalistic society, there's every ingredients needed for you guys to thrive as much as the as nature allows. And if you find your workers who are interested in building these projects, you should get them. And if you are right about the increased productivity, which I personally doubt, but as long as you're doing it without forcing it on people and with your own funds, I don't object to worker co-ops existing really. So I think then the um, the burden of proof would be on you to defend the current paradigm that we have, which is that CEOs in America on average make about 325 times the rate of pay as their employees, and that we have a system now in which most workers don't have democratic control in their jobs. So we're talking about an environment where you spend eight hours of your day, and you have no say as to what happens in your job. That, to me, is a fundamental problem, and that's one of the broken parts of our current system. Well, to me, it's not a fundamental problem. And to me, I think it shows a secret that a worker co-op or a social socialistic system will never reach in terms of the mechanism of a capitalistic society and why ultimately it wins, why it creates so much wealth that uh, that it looks that that even a poor worker in a capitalistic society ends up making more money than a, a rich one in a socialistic one. Uh, ultimately, it boils down to the allocation of that. Well, uh, just compare America in sure. compare a worker in America in the 60s to a to someone in the USSR. Sure, you said a rich one though. So you said that a worker in America is making more than a rich person in a colonial I'm not telling you country. you won't find a single one in the USSR who's not richer than a McDonald worker. Of course you will find this because communism is the accretion of power to central entities and therefore there are lots of paths for corruption open. But in general, the amount of wealth that was created by American society surpasses any sort of worries around the division of it. In, in other words, I, I end up being richer today uh, because Facebook is so rich and because there are these central entities that are making even more. And yet my life is great today because these big entities exist. But anyways, get, go to, going back to what you asked can, can, me. Okay, so you asked me to define socialism. Can you define communism for me? Well, to me... Com okay. You know, I'll let JF speak and then I'll comment because this was probably one of JF's low points of the debate, in my opinion. Communism is some kind of accomplished form of socialism, so I, I use the words interchangeably, but we're talking about control over the means of production, and we, I, tend to, I tend to try to use socialism for meaning a part of the, the means of production have been taken over, and communism meaning it's been taken over in full, but then the in full, the definition of the in full, uh, is very relative. For, for example, as far as I'm concerned, the means of production have been taken over so much in countries like Canada and the U.S. that we're essentially, we've attained communism at this point. <sighs> okay. Um... Even as a fan of JF, that 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 was that definition of communism was pretty bad. I, I have to say, sorry, 
America and Canada are not, by any reasonable definition, communist countries. Sorry. S sorry, JF, but y you're wrong about that. So I can define it for you. It's a moneyless class with stateless society. So we have not really had a true communist government in human history. No, and you won't, because uh, if you centralize power that much, you will have classes. Right, but I, like, I think your umbrage might be with, um, say, Stalinism or, or something of that nature. Is this what you're trying to associate this with? Well, uh, no, not even that. I, I take issue with control, democratic control, state control, and worker control if it is done against the will of what is being controlled. So going back to what you mentioned about the inequalities of our societies, uh, mm -hmm. I don't take mo it's not a problem for me, and it doesn't change the path of my life. If I look at the progression between my gr great-grandfather to me, it really doesn't change our lives that McDonald is 100 times richer than us or 1 billion times richer than us. It really doesn't because, matter. Because you're not poor. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I've been as poor. Okay. This is the problem that I have with a lot of, a lot of like, bread tubers. Or one of the problems. Um, just because somebody is rich doesn't in and of itself mean that somebody else is poor as a result of that person being rich. The economy is not like this limited pie where if some where where if one billionaire gets fifty percent of the pie, everybody else loses loses out. The the economy is much more complex than that, and economics can often be a win win situation rather than a win lose scenario. And if you have like some person say like an entrepreneur that invents some sort of like unique gadget that everybody likes guess what even if that person becomes a millionaire as a result of being of inventing this this gadget that everybody wants the poor people don't lose out if anything they benefit because not only do they have this gadget this new gadget that this hypothetical inventor created and all the jobs that come with manufacturing that gadget but the government can now tax um this hypothetical millionaire's revenue and use it to go into things like the social safety net so what a lot of communists don't understand is that if somebody becomes rich and somebody becomes a billionaire it doesn't mean that people lose out and a lot of the time it means that people win as someone can be i mean i've been in the streets i've been without uh, locations to live i've been without jobs and i've been with zero dollar in my account so I, I don't you can tell i'm not poor right now and yes i've been successful on youtube but i know what being poor is and really it doesn't change my view of capitalism when, even when i was poor it, it's not a, a lack of empathy that i have with poor, or a lack of understanding with poor people here it's a principal stance that i'm taking today sure so in the case of jeff bezos how much more does he make than the average worker in terms of like compensation I don't know. And he makes, really nine, he, makes about, he makes about $9 million an hour. So that's over hundreds of thousands of times what his average worker makes. Wouldn't you have to justify, because this is this is you proposing this, that he justifiably works hundreds of thousands of times more than his average worker in no, order to receive that compensation? The, because work... It's not about how much you work. It's about how much you contribute to society and the economy overall. overall. Time is not the unit of contributions to society. In other words, you can work all your life and produce less for society than Jeff Bezos could produce in a second. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't justify whether or not he gets paid that much more than his workers do, does it? Well, what do you mean by justify? Because it seems that embedded in your concept of justification is the assumption that work hours is the unit of contribution to society. Uh, no, I'm saying that if you work, you should be compensated for your work. I think that's something that we both agree on. At least I hope so. And yes, and is there anyone working at Amazon who's not getting compensated for their work? But are they being compensated adequately for the work? I mean, in the case of Amazon, if you're showing up there and you're risking your life and you're getting COVID and then you're actually having to shit and piss in bags, I would say, and I would posit this, that maybe getting 15 to $17 an hour doesn't justify that kind of lifestyle. And that maybe we should be paying them more. Maybe they should have more rights. Maybe they should be unionized so they can fight up against the pissing and shitting in bottles and cans. Maybe they can. I mean, they, they can if they want, really. Uh, as long as they're they're voluntary, voluntarily working for the salary they're given and they're accepting to piss in the bottle, so be it. I, I, I will not intervene in a third-party relationship in which people are voluntarily submitting eight hours of their day to something else in exchange of money. But do you think it's voluntary? Because if you don't have a job in America, you probably don't have health care. And if you don't have health care, you might die. And if you don't have a job, you can't pay rent or eat. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily voluntary. It's kind of like you're coerced out of survival. Okay. Um, Destiny made a critique of this argument in his review of this debate. 
And while I certainly have my issues with Destiny, I'm going to borrow his argument because it's actually really good. The, the coercion that workers face in order to actually work and contribute to the economy, that exists under every single system, whether that be capitalism, feudalism, market socialism, or Stalinism, or third positionism, or any system. Every system is structured in a way so that so that people have to work in order to survive. Like, ev in every economic system, whether that be third position, communism, market socialism, capitalism, whatever, you can't just sit on your ass all day and work. And, and not work and just, like, play video games all day. You're compelled to work either implicitly or explicitly, by the desire to survive. So Lance's argument against capitalism is not an argument against capitalism. It's, it's just an issue that exists in every single system that humans create ever. Well, uh, the state of default of humanity is to be faced with the natural elements. So I I'm not going to start seeing the employers that offers a cover from the natural elements, that offers an option to these people. I'm not going to start seeing him as the evil person, because the fact is, if Jeff Bezos wasn't there, and if all of the capitalists weren't there, and if all of the companies weren't there, these people would just be in the forest, literally running for their lives. And so, no, I'm not going to see the employer relationship as an extortionist one, when in fact, in, in this relationship, all that Jeff Bezos gives is an option. But are they in the forest looking for nuts or squirrels, or what, how does that work? Well, they'd be in the forest, potentially running away from uh, other tribes or running away from natural predators. Collecting nuts, I guess. Uh, you're trying to make a joke, and it really doesn't connect. No, I'm, not, I'm actually asking. I'm very confused by this. You're the first person who's ever yes, proposed humans this, this kind of idea. Uh, they do, they do. But I don't understand how the idea of survival in the animal kingdom is in any way related to economic systems for modern society that we're trying to propose here. Here it is. Here is how it's cut. Okay, the argument that JF is laying out is perfectly crystal clear. If Lance doesn't understand it, that's his problem. Do you think that there are some human families that make more babies than others? Yeah, of course there is. Do you think that therefore their genes are more present in the next generation as opposed to the other families that made less babies? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other factors to contemplate there, but sure. If, if one person has one kid and one person has 10 kids, that person with 10 kids will have more genes in the gene pool. So if there are a bunch of genes that make you such that, one, you don't produce anything for society, but two, you can beg as well as others, and in fact better than others, for governmental support. Do you think that this might cause a problem on evolutionary time scales? If the government was to start feeding these families with everything they need to survive and make further babies, further higher numerous babies. You're, the solution to your problem would just be to have as many kids as possible. Like, wouldn't it just be if you just fuck a ton and have 30 kids, you're going to win at my strange scenario? Well, uh, that would be the solution from the perspective of a human wanting to undermine the system, but this human in a capitalistic society would find himself with the limits of his own resource. He would find himself punished by the system if he cannot find something to produce, something to sell, something to trade. The problem is if you start rewarding people arbitrarily for just having needs, you end up rewarding the having of needs and you end up rewarding everyone who can just beg more money or equal amounts of money while not producing for the rest of society a good output. It sounds to me like you really have a problem with welfare, but you don't want to say it outright. Oh, no, I mean, I, I'm totally fine saying it outright. I take issue with welfare. Do, do you support things like UBI and welfare? I absolutely support UBI, but I support real UBI, and that I think that we should be taxing those who make the most in society and using those taxes to be able to pay for those who can't work. And, and Yeah, that, that's, that's UBI. <laughs> I, I don't know why you had to say, oh, I support real UBI, when you just described like, what most people consider to be UBI. Honestly, everyone, uh, to a certain extent. Now, do you realize, given that you seem to accept the theory of evolution, and you seem to accept all of the basis that w that if you feed a family that makes more babies, they, you will have more of them in the next generation and more of their genes? Do you see the unsustainability of this system over evolutionary times? So the problem comes in, in that more people are going to receive more food and make more kids? Is that it? Exactly. And that ultimately you will find yourself with an infinitely growing population until you cannot sustain their needs. You cannot, you cannot produce enough to sustain the needs that you've created. 
Okay, so if I'm going to snap us back to reality, um, in our current system, we overproduce food. As a humanity, like as a species, we currently produce twice as much food as we consume. We, we throw out twice as much food. Uh, sorry, we throw out, like, we produce twice the amount of food that we would normally be able to consume. So the problem isn't food production in any way. It happens to be distribution. And that is usually the case with a lot of things in our capitalist systems. So it doesn't go down to a matter of, like, how many babies are going to be able to be born at a given time if they're receiving a certain amount of food. It all comes down to the fact that we have certain systems in place that benefit certain people. Well, you say you snap back to reality, but really you slap back to an alternate reality. Uh, first, the surplus of food you mentioned, that doesn't matter. Uh, if you have created an infinite need function, you're going to reach a point at which you have people consuming all of this food. I don't think you've addressed the problem intergenerationally. How do we lead to a sustainable system in which yet we are creating infinite needs? Yeah, but I mean, you keep going back to this. It sounds really eugenics-y, right? Like, I, ultimately, if I really boil... Okay. What JF is advocating for is eugenics... The problem, though, is that saying, oh, this is eugenics, is not an argument. Because if you say, if you get morally outraged and say, oh, this is eugenics, JF and his audience are just going to say, yeah, it's eugenics, so what? They're, they're, they're going to own it. You have to argue further than that. Hold this down. It kind of sounds like poor people have too many babies. Is, 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 that, is that a disingenuous... It's one way to phrase it. The thing is, as a capitalist, I don't even take issue with poor people having babies. That's not okay, th this is important. A lot of people in BreadTube misinterpreted JF's argument to be, oh, well, we don't want the poor to make babies because the poor are genetically inferior. No, JF's, argue JF's issue isn't with poor people making babies. JF's issue is with people who can't support themselves and who need to be on welfare in order to survive making babies and that's different from poor people as a group as long as they have the ways to self-sustain their families and to uh, to deliver services to them the problem is when you start taking from others to feed these families then you are entering a relationship of theft and that's a problem evolutionarily and i don't hear a solution you seem to be your solution is well that's eugenics and therefore i don't have to address it the thing is we've discussed the logical basis of what you call eugenics you accept all of the series of facts and rational processes behind my conclusions but you end by saying well i'll call it eugenics and therefore i don't have to address it I I would well, like it, you to address Okay, it. sure. If, if you would like me to address this, uh, yeah, the, the solution to uh, like large population growth happens to be both historically and from a scientific standpoint, uh, the education and empowerment of women. So if you take any country that is uh, you know, developing and happens to have uh, a large population growth through the education and empowerment of women of their population, you will see uh, a lowering of uh, exceptional birth rates. So that's, that's a solution that already has, or sorry, that's a problem that already has a solution. I think it has a local solution in a bubble of time. And I, I will say you're totally right. When you, it, what you call education and empowerment, I, I tend to see it more as anti-reproductive propaganda, but okay, let's take your word. <laughs> education and, and empowerment. It's true that if you pass a perfectly fertile woman to the unit. I like that laugh that he did when, when JF said anti-reproductive propaganda. <laughs> the, the look on this guy's face university system and you keep her eyes open in front of the professors and you get her through 10 years of her most fertile life uh, into learning quantum physics it's true that she's going to produce less babies uh, that being said i don't think it's a sustainable system because what you have as a reaction to this is simply people evolve away from going at the university people evolve low iq to avoid the university and i think that what we're seeing in our society is we've attained this peak we we have reached a peak of iq and now the high iq people are really doing two uh, making two little babies so what we're going to see in the next few generations is probably a decrease of iq a higher reproductivity of the lower iq scales and that's okay you know uh, but it, it means that the system here is not sustainable. It's like you're, you're not going to force people to go to university, or if you do, then you'll be committing an immoral act in my view. Uh, I kind of like don't want to get too bogged down on IQ. Uh, I didn't think we'd be talking about that in a debate uh, between capitalism and socialism, uh, to be totally frank, and I, I kind of think of it as incel, uh, sorry, astrology for incels. So maybe um, if you think that it's like a temporary solution to a problem, but it's one that bears out, and you just admitted that it bears out every single time that it's implemented, why not continue to do the thing that works? Isn't that just the natural progression of this? I mean, the thing is, something can work, and it, it won't work over evolutionary times. There are, there are temporary solutions over evolutionary times that can work, but it, evolution by its nature is already fighting against it, and I think it's already what we're seeing. Uh, I think that you have high fertility in low IQ females right now. They are the re reproductive elite, and this is going to have impacts down the line. It's going to change our society. We're going to have a lot of stupid people, and that's okay. I actually have respect for, for low IQ people. But yeah, it, it doesn't solve the problem on the evolutionary scale, and I'm left thinking, well, capitalism, as all of these solutions built in and capitalism never even wanted to fix these problems it's just that in the simple systems of consent voluntarism and the accumulation of property somehow the ingredients were there to make a human society that was 
acclimated enough to nature that it wouldn't fight against it. The problem with the projects you're proposing is that they are really all fights against nature. And we can get the more in detail on the worker co-op, for example, but that's another fight against nature. The fact is that <clears throat> the brains of people, of workers, have not demonstrated their fitness at managing the world, at managing their own companies. So why would I put them in control of the whole companies? To me, it looks like giving to a, a very important decision to a bunch of people who haven't demonstrated their ability to make particularly good decisions. So that's sure. why I can, I, can address, I can address that one. All yeah. right. Uh, first off, I think your entire plan, you're basically just describing the movie Idiocracy. And then secondly, to workers working in you know, the means of their own production, uh, you know, having supervisors and stuff like that, those exist within every single one of the work cooperatives and the big examples I was trying to give you. Those have hierarchies, but they are justified hierarchies. And that if you are the CEO of the company, you will only make between five to eight times what your workers do, but you will justifiably have to do about five to eight times the work that they do. Well, at the same time, at the end of the year, every year they get to vote on their board of CEOs. And that if you are a shitty CEO or you're a CEO who's just basically embezzling money for your own uh, enrichment, then you will be removed effectively, which would be a much better system, a much more democratic system for every single person who's working for these companies instead of the dictatorships that we have now, which is basically every major corporation in the US. Well, <clears throat> I agree with some of what you say. First, uh, the CEOs are doing embezzlement. Yes, there are dirty players in capitalism, and there are forces that are to be criticized, and they, they, they make our world less productive. I'm, not, I'm just not sure that even a worker co-op can stop this kind of system of corruption. I'm just not sure that the people has any insight that would allow to fix these problems. Ultimately, the, the worker is just one component in the whole ecosystem of a company. Why don't why don't you have customers co-op or providers co-op? Why is a company being defined by the people who are giving work hours to it only, when in fact the company is a system of ins and outs, of demands and requests and offers? Uh, that is. Well, I mean, why not offer to Yelp reviewers too? At the end of the day, you should offer it to every single person who's exactly. involved in the company in some respect. Uh, yeah, well, that's asinine nonsense. You would you have to have it with the people who work in the company itself. That's what workers owning the means of production do. They're the ones who actually produce the products. Otherwise, there's no point in involving outside. You can take outside influence. You should take feedback as a company, but ultimately you're the one making the products that people buy. Yeah, but all I'm pointing is that the unit of making the product is a very arbitrary unit. Uh, ultimately, there's work that's been going on into the parts that were bought by the company. So why don't we give control of the workers that produce, say, the car wheel drive? Why don't they control the company that makes the car? Well, it seems like it's pretty arbitrarily divided on, well, these guys are spending eight hours in this building or that building. Capitalism has resolved this by offer and demand and price at the moment of trade on a voluntary basis. So you, you really can't do anything. But once you buy the wheel drive, you can make a car with it. And you don't need to know anything else than this is the price of a wheel drive. And if you're not happy with that price, you can go to another company and get it from them. Why would we give control and decision-making power to units that have really shown nothing else than just an interest into renting their body for eight hours to a given entity? To me, it strikes me as unnatural and potentially leading to failure. That being said, as, as I said at the beginning, I'm all for worker co-ops to be given their chance. I just don't think it's going to be a particularly good way to manage a company. So they've already been given their chance. There's already like a wide body of data that we can use to see whether or not they've been uh, efficient uh, within the marketplace. Now, again, I, I don't know how many times I need to reiterate this. They are not directly going to be in charge of all decision making. You will have to have people who are superiors, people who are going to manage teams. The difference being is that those people can be voted out uh, if they're not performing adequately. That's basically it. And at the end of the day, why would a worker want to have any uh, involvement in a company, even though he's just kind of like a flesh meat sack there for exploitation? Uh, because I think fundamentally, every single person should have skin in the game. It'll make them better employees. I mean, the, the results speak for themselves. Every single time people who are involved in worker cooperatives are pulled on this, they report better job satisfaction, better involvement. Uh, they're more encouraged to work in the job because they're actually being involved in the products they're making. I've seen these uh, studies. I find them extremely focused on single domains and extremely limited. Uh, I think that if you were to build an entire society where like 50% of the whole economy is in worker co-ops, I think you'd start seeing problems that you wouldn't detect in these studies. Uh, that being said, you know, again, worker co-ops should be let to exist. They can exist without problems in the capitalistic system. So, so uh, in the case of the Italian region, I was telling you about one third of all the businesses in that region are worker cooperatives. So we have an overwhelmingly large data set to be able to like pull information from. And it's, it's been showing itself time and time again to be more efficient than its counterparts and as well produce higher job satisfaction for the workers. All right, well, uh, if people are happy in Italy doing that, they should keep going. Now, uh, the efficiency of democratic system. Uh, do you realize that you're pushing for a system in the workplace that is absolutely unsatisfactory in terms of how it manages our politics, for example, because we have democratic politics. Uh, do. do you realize that, are you satisfied with the way our politics is turning out? No, but that doesn't have anything to do with the fundamental principle that I think every person should have a vote in democracy. Like, just because I don't enjoy if Donald Trump gets elected doesn't make me think immediately that I should just abolish democracy like that. I mean, I don't think that there's any reason why we should skirt into something like authoritarianism or fascism just because we don't like the results of the election. Well, I, I certainly don't, do not advocate for authoritarianism. But what I note is that the transfer of authority that happens when you create a democracy is to take what you found was immoral if done by a dictator or a single individual and to suddenly find it moral when it is imposed by the mob. There is a fundamental problem in that all of the authoritarian 
things that you seem to criticize within the current structure of hierarchy in a capitalistic company. You just want to delegate this authority to the group. Why is it better when the authority, the same authority with potentially the same oppression onto the individual is suddenly transferred to a wider group? Well, you're, if you're using the parallels of politics, that's the same problem, right? Like, why is it better if someone, say, a fascist, has complete authoritarian control over his people, which is the current paradigm we have with corporations? With corpor okay. If you believe in democracy, there are only two reasons why you can logically believe in democracy. You can either believe in democracy because you believe that it's an absolute moral necessity that people have the right to vote for their government, for their... uh for what kind of government they want. Or you can believe in democracy as an engineering mechanism for good government. If you believe in democracy as an engineering mechanism for good government, then you have to accept the fact that democracy gave us, among other things, people like Hillary Clinton or people like uh, Dick Cheney. And, but if you believe that democracy is a moral necessity, then it's like, okay, well, why, why, am I, why am I or anybody else entitled to political power? Which is what you're saying if you, if you say that democracy is an absolute moral necessity. But the other problem and the reasons why I would say that it's kind of better to have like an authoritarian dictator rather than the mob is because the mob, unlike a lone authoritarian dictator is uniquely prone to making decisions based solely on what is fashionable at the moment. Which, sometimes that can be good, and but sometimes that can be bad. But it's not because it's not... But what is fashionable at the moment, which is what governs the mob, has absolutely nothing to do with reason. Whereas if you have a dictator, the dictator is more likely to not make decisions based on what is fashionable at the moment. And so as a result is more likely to be more rational and make better decisions. We have small amounts of boards and CEOs. Their only responsibility is the fiduciary responsibility they have to their shareholders. All the decision making is made by them and it can affect millions and millions of people sometimes. So that is a fundamental problem. I think we should expand democracy into those companies so that everyone has a say in what involves their lives. But for example, don't you take issue with the fact that people have voted across the years drug laws and that ultimately it is the people who is oppressing drug smokers and putting them in jail? So if you want to talk about the history of drug uh, prohibition, a lot of it is centered around racism in the United States, particularly to vilify uh, black and Hispanic people. And one of the problems with that is it was propagated through the U.S. system and then spread worldwide. Uh, its racist origins do not in any way think to me that it makes it uh, okay that that was... Okay. Assuming that all of what Lance is saying is true... Lance is actually making JF's point for him, that democracy leads to bad outcomes, or what Lance would consider to be racist outcomes. ...permitted for so many years. There was a huge amount of money spent on fear-mongering and scapegoating individuals so that everyone in society ended up thinking that drugs were bad. That's where that all comes from, and this goes back to a big problem we have with the capitalist system. Under a capitalist system, if you have capital, you have power. So the more capital you have, the more power you have to basically change... Oh, okay. I, I just thought of... The best question that I could that I would ask I would want to ask Lance if I were debating him. Okay. Here's the question that I have for anyone on the left who subscribes to the idea that democracy is a good system of government. If Nick Fuentes or someone like him were to be elected president of the United States, someone that you think as a leftist is a fascist who is a complete lunatic. Would you be okay with an undemocratic military coup to overthrow Nick Fuentes? That's the question that I would want to ask. Anyone on the left watching this video, that, that's the question that I have for you. Do you, would you subscribe to the idea of democracy even if democracy elevates Nick Fuentes or somebody that you think, you as a leftist, think is a complete moral monster it, or to, to phrase the question in a different way are you willing to stand by democracy even if democracy elevates somebody that you think is a complete moral monster to a position of power 
like Nick Fuentes, or rather you as a leftist, believe is a moral monster? That's the question that I have for Lance, and that's the question that I have for anyone that's a fan of Lance or any other bread tuber. Are you willing to tolerate, if you believe in democracy, are you willing to tolerate democracy if the people want somebody like Nick Fuentes or anybody else that you think is a complete evil bastard in the government? society as a whole. So that is a fundamental problem to me because you have individuals who will have a lot of crude capital, a lot of crude power. They will be able to influence politics. That's the bigger problem I find with liberal democracy in any way, shape, or form than I take with the very fundamental idea that everyone should have a democratic vote. Well, I think that you're making my point here because you're you're talking about people and you're demonstrating a case in which they were they were driven into a bad vote, a vote that I guess you disagree with. Do you disagree with the drug laws as they've been enacted oh, and applied absolutely. in the absolutely. US? Oh, yes, no, of course, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that uh, drugs should be legalized. Um, but that doesn't so, change the fact that, again, under the system, it is those with capital who will be able to exude power over politics, who will be able to influence politics, either through lobbying or other coercive methods. There's a huge entrenchment uh, with the, both the prison industrial complex that required a large amount of people to be uh, fulfilling those empty seats when it comes to prisoners. Like, this, this whole thing is like, you're, you're opening up a huge uh, can of worms in terms of like uh, a different topic, but that doesn't change the fundamental principle again, that I believe that everyone should have a democratic vote. Like, do you not think that? Do you not think that democracy should exist? Okay. This should be obvious by now, but JF and his audience does not believe in democracy. Which, I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, It's kind of the correct position to not believe in democracy. But th- this should be obvious to Lance by now. JF does not take it for granted that democracy is a good thing. I think that democracy is an aberration and a violation of individual rights. I I recognize that there are some things in society, like the gathering of trash, that may need some kind of collective system, and perhaps democracy is this imperfect system that could allow us to determine the schedule of trash collection. But ultimately, I think that democracy is an authoritarian regime putting the authoritarianism into the hands of the mob, and so I reject democracy as a whole. So what is your alternative? So you are the one who's ultimately advocating for authoritarianism, not me. No, I'm not. I'm I'm advocating against authority. I I do not think that a group of X million people should have authority over whether I smoke drugs or not. Yeah, so how do you manage politics then? Do you just want to abolish the state? Are are you going for like Yes, I'm basically a minarchist, so I I think of the state as a... Okay, here's the problem with uh, JF's position on democracy. Even though he is correct in believing that democracy is bad, The problem, though, is that even if JF advocates for a minarchist state, or what is commonly called a night watchman state, the night watchman state still has to be run by somebody, which means that even if you have a limited state that's basically a night watchman state, which is what JF is advocating for here, you still have to make the decision of whether or not you want it to be democratic or run by a dictator or run by like an aristocracy or something. Which means that if JF rejects democracy, even if in his ideal system the state is simply a a night watchman state or a minarchist state, functionally speaking, it still has to be run by a dictator or some form of authoritarian government, even if it's a minarchist government or some sort of authoritarian system. So, JF really... (sighs) Okay, sorry about that. Um, Stuff came up and I had to wait till the next day to finish this. Okay, as I was saying before, um, the problem with JF's minarchism is that he really hasn't thought about what the minarchist state would be like. He just knows that he wants a minarchist state and that it doesn't, he doesn't want it to be a democracy, but he hasn't really thought about how the minarchist state should be governed. Okay. All right, but because this damn thing is too long already, I'm just going to speed through this. As a kind of small operation that should remain less than 1% of the economy. 
handled, whatever really can't be handled by the rest, but I'm for the abolishment of most of the state. And uh, as far as the control of whatever is left, uh, there could be democratic components to it, but what I ultimately believe in is a super strong <coughs> constitutional order that essentially keeps this democracy from growing into the kind of authoritarian nightmare that it has grown into right now. So I'm assuming you're essentially an anarcho-capitalist, which means you're a cartoon character. And ultimately what that means is that- Is this thing working? I'm always paranoid about. That. You would have to justify unjust hierarchies, right? That would be the idea of what an anarchist is. Any unjust hierarchy, the burden of proof is lying upon them to justify that hierarchy. That's, that's exactly what the definition means. In your society, then, I assume the rich, the, the incredibly wealthy, would just be the ones who had access to everything they needed, like hospitals, schools, education, and those who are unable to accrue wealth or survive in that society would just have to die by the wayside. Uh, I don't take issue with people dying if, if it must happen, and in fact, everyone dies. Okay. This, in my opinion, was uh, JF's lowest point debate um okay the the prop the issue that i the issue and I'm, I'm gonna say this even as a jf fan this this looks absolutely horrible jf um like I, i'm sorry like it it is bad it is a bad thing if people die, and we should take issue with people dying. So, sorry, JF, but um, even as a fan of JF, th this comment in particular did not sit well with me at all. When, when I first, or when I looked at, wa watched this debate. Um, see, the, the moral framework that a lot of libertarians operate in, and I think this is the case with JF, is that for libertarians, maximizing individual freedom is the only thing that matters. And libertarian morality, fundamentally, is about maximizing individual freedom, even at the cost of other things that most people would consider to be important, and even at the cost of human life. So, but the problem with that morality is that if you're willing to maximize individual liberty even at the cost of humanitarianism and human life, it can take society down a very, very dark road and it can lead to a lot of very dark conclusions, which is what we're seeing now with JF's I don't have an issue with people dying comment. But... I'm, I'm sorry. Um, even as a fan of JF, I, I can't agree with him on this. Um, the government and society does have an, a moral obligation to make sure people die since dying in and of itself or death in and of itself is, is intrinsically a bad thing that we should want to prevent. Uh, that being said, you say that I justify unjust hierarchy. No, to the contrary. Uh, there is an unjust hierarchy right now, as you've said it yourself, in the fact that a mob of people cannot have decided that for the last hundred years, we were arresting the, the people who just decided to smoke drugs for themselves. I believe that this is an unjust hierarchy. <laughs> smoke drugs, by the way. Hierarchy, and I'm defending the opposite, an absence of hierarchy or a presence of hierarchy in those cases where it is consented to by the individuals. So in your ideal scenario then, in, in this like ANCAP wonderland, what exactly takes place? Like how do people um, govern themselves? Like how, how does someone have access to a hospital? How does someone have access to a road if the government itself is not even building the roads? Well, uh, we can talk about the roads, and I, I think that the roads would be like they were before the governments took them over, which is that most roads have been built by the people who live on them and are then sold to the government. Most roads are actually private entities that have been handed to the government just for the maintenance function. As far as hospitals, they would follow the law of demand and offer. So if you're a doctor, you're selling a service. If there's not enough people buying your services, then your hospital is not worth existing. It will disappear eventually because it doesn't make enough profits. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you could have in these societies superb systems of health insurance, but you may not also. It all depends on what people need and what people are willing to pay. And ultimately, the free market will be what determines what exists. I don't know where you read that. Like, I've never heard someone say that all roads were built privately and then bought to the government. But on average, roads are usually paid for by the government itself through taxpayer dollars and then established and built. And yes, the roads would then turn over to, I guess, people in the ANCAP paradise, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, let's just say, development of new roads would ever take place without some kind of social funding. Like, you have to understand some- Okay. One more thing that I j that just popped into my head. Yeah. Um. The problem with a lot of libertarians is that oh, this doesn't really apply to JF, but this applies to libertarians as a group. 
they fundamentally believe in a naive view of man that man is inherently good, whether implicitly or explicitly. And this is not a criticism of JF, this doesn't really apply to JF, but um, if you look at, say, the Founding Fathers, their entire worldview were, was basically based on essentially the assumption that man was an intrinsically good creature. And that if you just allow people to do their own thing and leave, and ha have the government leave people alone, then people are going to govern society well. But the problem is that that's not the case. Uh, mankind sucks. And this is what the Founding Fathers didn't understand, and this is what a lot of libertarians don't understand, and this is what a lot of people who are like ANCAPs certainly don't understand. If you have a libertarian society, um, there are going to be a lot of evil people, and those evil people are, are going to do a lot of very evil things that are going to wreck your society, or at the very least make it not worth living in. level unless you happen to be wealthy or i mean outside of that in your ideal scenario everyone would be left by the wayside like the, the poorest individuals in society wouldn't have access to healthcare, they wouldn't have access to education they wouldn't have access to toilets access to toilets uh, i think that that toilets are i mean people are buying their own toilets today they're building their house and they're putting a toilet in it uh, yeah if they're not homeless because if they're homeless they're not building a house at all well yeah if they're homeless uh, the, the opposite of this is to say that someone who's homeless is entitled to have a house builder work for them and so who's the authoritarian here well it is lens right here because he's telling us that you are empowered to compel the house builder and the doctor and the hospital to serve this homeless person who has nothing to offer to them so the, the reason i care about sustainable system is that ultimately lens system is unsustainable authoritarian and consists in ultimately the forced labor of a bunch of people who shouldn't be forced to work or if he if he has them not through forced labor if he doesn't force the doctor to cure them and force the house builder to build a house for them he will be essentially forcing them through printed money or debt or government intervention which will be another kind of force and another kind of theft yeah so in terms of building houses for the homeless um it's, it's statistically been proven you don't have to do it from a moral standpoint but it actually saves your society money at the end of the day it costs an overwhelming amount of money to police and to hospitalize people who are homeless whether they have a drug addiction or they are uh, you know susceptible to crime or things like that so ultimately yes building houses would be something that would reduce the amount of crime and reduce the amount of burden on uh, your hospitalization system on top of which we currently live in a current paradigm right now the capitalist one the one that you know exists in which there are a very small amount of people in this case it happens to be six individuals who have the collective wealth of seven billion humans so we have a gross disproportionate disparity of income redistrib uh, redistribution and a big problem with that is that they are not being used to put that money towards anything of good like i know a lot of the money is obviously going to be shareholder value i'm not trying to say that it isn't. But if we have such a huge concentration of wealth into the hands of the very few at the expense of everybody else, there should be more equitable systems. That's what I'm advocating for. Like systems that work better for every single human. It, it, you don't even have to do it from a human perspective. It just works from, like, better from a societal perspective. Well, uh, I don't think there should be a more equitable wealth distribution. And moments of the past where we have seek this more equitable wealth distribution. Okay, the problem with Lance over here is that he's confusing equitable wealth distribution and equality with material prosperity, but those two things are not the same thing and they don't necessarily have relationships to each other. Led to societies that have just not produced as much beauty and as much wealth and as much productivity for everyone as those who are more capitalistic. That being said, on the question of uh, the homeless and saving the homeless can benefit society, that we never really get the final count on this because if we got the final count, uh, you could just start a business. Uh, in, you, you would start a business in saving homeless and you would cash in on it. We never really quite get this. We get what's, the government setting up. What's the problem well, with that business? You would essentially get them out of homeless status and you would have yeah, to deal the, with the, them. The, that burden, the burden that the homeless people provide is to society itself. It's going to be in the amount of money that you as society have to spend on hospitals, on policing, stuff like that. So there's no profit incentive for a private company to come in and solve that. Well, then we enter another domain, which is uh, if, if the homeless are costing things to society because they're committing crimes, and you, you say that it's, it's be, it becomes an economic gain because you will keep them from committing a crime, then you're essentially getting extorted by a bunch of criminals. And we cannot, as a society, have organizing principle that say, we're going to pay you not to become a criminal, because it's you're beginning the extortion here. It's like, how many people, how much are you going to pay for just keeping them off the streets, as we say? And there's no end to it. Again, it's an unsustainable system. What do you think causes crime? Causes crime. Uh, I mean, what causes people to eat and consume pornography and do ABC? It's just, it's the human brain. The human brain yeah, so, causes so, crimes. So the answer is poverty. Poverty is typically the most common precursor to crime. And it makes sense. Okay, there are a lot. Okay, crime in the United States is mostly relegated to like the big cities. But a lot of areas that are in poverty in the United States are not big cities, but rather rural areas in the countryside. But yet, the rural countryside, even like the worst poverty areas, don't have a lot of crime. They have other issues like opioid addiction, but they don't have a lot of crime. 
the crime is mostly happening in the cities. So if Lance, if what Lance is saying is true, then what we would expect is for the big cities that are full of poverty and rural areas that are full of poverty to both have large amounts of crime, but that's not what's happening. The crime is mostly in the cities, even though there are large rural parts of the United States that are that have a lot of poverty. So Lance is simply wrong here. So if you don't have money to feed yourself or you happen to be addicted to drugs, you're probably going to turn to crime to be able to feed yourself or get yourself those drugs. So it has nothing to do with some kind of innate probability. There's, there's no gene for poverty that exists within the human genome. You don't know that. Okay, is that, is that what you're proposing? You've discovered the poverty gene? Is that what we're at? No, because genes don't work that way. It's not a poverty gene or a homosexuality gene. The problem is that the human genome is a complex entity, and some, some of it makes you more likely to be intelligent, less likely to be intelligent. And down the line, in the causal influence of thousands of genes, uh, you may have paths that lead to more likely criminality or less likely to be criminal, and, or less likely to be poor or more likely to be poor. Uh, there's definitely polygenic studies that show genetic correlation with wealth, genetic correlation with IQ and educational attainment. So there's, the answer to your question is almost yes. It's just not one gene. It's a thousand genes. Isn't this your field of study? Yes, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Yeah, so why is your understanding of this so cartoonish? Like, I, I don't, I can't wrap my head around the idea that you think poor people were genetically predisposed to being poor. Well, I will let people judge who's more cartoonish be, be, between the guy who has no training in biology and asks for the poverty gene, and the other guy who does have training in biology and who informs you that we have correlations between genes and poverty and IQ and education. This is a fallacious appeal to authority. Attainment in the thousand counts. Well, yeah, I mean, they'll have to judge between a clown on the internet who makes jokes for a living and someone whose actual academic field of study is in this very fucking specialization. Okay, next time, I, next time I do one of these videos where I'm, like, going through something and responding to it, I need to, like, have some sort of ad blocker because this is, like, annoying as shit. I mean, do you have an argument? Because Oh, by the, by the way, this... Lan JF did an appeal to authority fallacy, but Lance just appealed did an appeal to an unauthority. It's like I, I don't even know. I can pull the studies. We can get into the nature papers that look into the meta study of Altwin studies. And the thing is, do you have an argument, or do, do we have nothing here? Uh, yeah, I do have an argument. According to the uh, International Monetary Fund, as well as numerous studies on what's the causal link between poverty uh, and crime, it's almost always established that crime is a precursor. Uh, sorry, poverty is a precursor to crime. Like that, that, that has been established time and time. Then why are there so many rural areas that have poverty? That, but that don't have crime the way that inner cities do. Again, I, I, I've yet to see anyone propose the fact that there is a genetic link for people becoming poor outside of maybe well, like uh, the bell curve. Well, <laughs> uh, you can get into nature papers and you type genetic correlation between uh, GWAS studies and twin studies and you'll find, you'll find genome-wide association analysis of risk tolerance and risky behavior. That's one that's more specialized. I would have to find the one that gives all the answers that you want. But there's definitely genetic correlation between the genes on the one hand, the twin studies establishing the polygenic influence of genes and all of the factors we've talked about. Now, have you ever realized that it's not because there's a correlation between poverty and criminality that this is not this correlation is not ultimately explained by a genetic influence? Well, yeah, but I think the idea between correlation and causation there, I mean, you're doing the heavy lifting on the other part, right? At the end of the day, if it's poverty that is going to be the, the precursor to crime, then those who are impoverished most likely will have lower test scores on whatever, like, quotient you're trying to give them. They'll have lower IQ scores, obviously, because they are embattled in poverty. That wouldn't surprise me to find that out. That does, that's not an indicator that somehow they're genetically predisposed to being poor. Like, I've never heard anyone suggest that, that there happens to be a genetic coding that makes people, like, impoverished. Well, uh, you can go uh, look why evolution is true. The blog, they have a post recently called How Much Variation in Human Behavior is Due to Variation in Our Gene. Answer, quite a bit. And so the reason you've not been exposed to these ideas is that you've been presumably hanging out in uh, social circles of leftism. Uh, there is seriously no scientific question today that the genes influence all of the factors we talked about, criminality. I okay, that is a good point. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to be into politics, you shouldn't be in an echo chamber. You got to listen to all different uh, perspectives. IQ, educational attainment, wealth, uh, it's definite. The, the definite answer is yes, and you, you'll see the links to the original peer-reviewed study in that blog post. Are we going to talk about uh, capitalism or socialism at all? Is, is that going to be on the menu? Or? Well, you know, it, it, we're still talking about it. That's the important thing, is that we're, we're talking about these issues because if evolution applies to humans, and it does, and if genes matter to behavior, then socialistic systems, welfare systems, UBI systems are unsustainable over evolutionary times. That is my point tonight, and I, all I hear is Adominance, insults, jokes, a guy who recognizes himself that he's a comedian on the internet. Uh, I, I was expecting more. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I was not, so I've been, I've been basically met with exactly what my expectations uh, presented. I'll, I'll say this, though. When it, when it comes to all those problems, and what exactly is the causal link, and what exactly is going to create, uh, let's say, more poverty in society, ultimately you would want to see less, right? I, I'd assume? Less poverty? Yeah, less, less poverty. You'd, you'd like to see more equality, right? More, more people living their best lives, I would assume? 
Not necessarily, you know, I, I take planet Earth as what it is, you know, when I look at the population, whether it's of animals, of plants or of humans, I don't see something that must be manipulated towards something better because of my taste. I don't have that kind of narcissism to think that my preferences over the world should overtake it. I, I see it as a natural system that will develop and that will either sustain or not sustain. And so when I look at humanity, I'm fine with our past, for example. You know, if, if I look at the human population a million years ago, I can imagine that they were living kind of rough lives. And I don't take issue with this. I'm fine with what we are. We are animals. We come from populations of apes, and we are subject to evolution. I'm fine with everything we've went through. And sometimes I think that in what we think is an advance, we are actually directing our societies toward systems that should not be uh, should not be adopted, and that we should, yes, return to a state that is perhaps more poor, but more in line with nature. I mean, from my perspective, I think if we both agree that humans evolve over time, so do economic systems evolve over time, then we should be taking the aspects of those economic systems and then utilizing what works the best and then trying to improve our lives and the lives of everyone around us. Because ultimately, it's not even from like an egotistical thing. It can be from a more like selfish reason. I think everyone's lives are better when everyone is collectively thriving. The more poor people there are, the more people who are like suffering on the street, the less quality of life you are going to have. I mean, the more crime that there's on the street, the more problems everyone else is going to have. If you improve the lives and the conditions of everyone around you, then we will also live better lives. That's one way to see it. Uh, you know, there were poor times in the past of my great grandparents that somehow, sometimes I think it was still a better time in a better world. So it's not all about wealth, definitely. And there are desirable things of societies of the past that got abolished by the current uh, eccentric lifestyle and the over perfusion of wealth and money and the system. And I'm fine with poverty existing. I don't want to combat it because when you start combating it, you start entering the game of unsustainability, the game of feeding the birds, feeding the squirrels. And to me, that's a dangerous path to take. Um, I, I don't know where we move from here, James. Did, did we have, do you want to go to the next section or should we? We shall. And so, okay, um, we're not going to sit through the rest of this because this video is going to get go way too long if we do. Okay, so, so to wrap this up, and I'm sorry to all you people who like it when I script these, these videos, but I just had to do a response to this. Um... So to wrap this up, Jeff gave the darkest possible argument in favor of capitalism, uh, and Lance didn't know what the hell he was talking about about anything. And yeah, JF won the debate, and he won the debate so much that even Vosh and Destiny had to admit that JF won the debate. Okay. Uh, Thanks for watching. If you like this video or agreed with anything that I said, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, follow me on BitChute, Telegram, and Odyssey. This is uh, Wolf signing out.